Hello. Hello. Wonderful. We are the first. This is nice. <laughs> so how have you been? Very good. Very good. Doing a lot of podcasts. Wonderful. I can imagine. I can imagine. I think that we are on time. Uh, we have a minute, but I see people already uh, gathering in. See that we already have eight participants. Uh, we'll wait for you know one more minute before we start. We'll wait for everybody. This is nice. I get to just glance at your library. <laughs> I'm looking for good books, apart from naturally. That's <laughs> All right. So it's time. Um, and I want to thank everybody joining and everyone's going to join. And more than anything, uh, thank uh, Ron for you know, participating with us. And I really want to welcome you to this session. Uh, and before we dive in, I want to just expand a little bit for maybe the people that have been uh, not really aware of the industry for the past 30 years about who you are, just a little bit. Uh, so first of all, uh, among your many talents, you're an author of, you know, multiple successful books. You've been influential in, in the accounting space, I think, further than most of anyone that I know. And I think like the fact that you're on the top list year after year uh, is evidence to that. And I, I think, you know, a, a personal statement that I can make is you're by far one of the nicest people this space has seen. And it's very, very different, I think, than, you know, when when I first met you, it was such a, a distance from the image on stage that, you know, as you know, like people, okay, you, you know, you talk about things and, you know, you're people that a lot of people look up to. And the feeling was that, okay, maybe there's going to be a distance. And what I discovered is like the exact opposite. Like you bring the same passion and heart you know how to bring with your desire to actually make an impact in this space. This is you, like on stage and off stage. So uh, for people that haven't met you in person, you should. Uh, and you know, I see that you're like rolling your eyes. Don't worry, no one is going to come to your house now. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> But uh, to the people who have joined us, I'm Omri. I'm uh, one of the founders at Anchor. We're a revenue automation system. Uh, we basically automate getting paid. So starting from proposals, automating invoicing, automating uh, basically getting paid and naturally closing the cycles on billing. And a big uh, part that we are here is that we're collaborating together to create uh, a very, very easy solution to implement uh, the brilliance of you know, Ron's teaching around the subscription model, which we're going to dive you know, very much into it. So without further ado, please help me welcoming Ron. And Ron, how are you? Great, Omri. Thank you for that. Wow, you read it just as I wrote it. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <clears throat> so, like, I think, like, for everybody, and whenever we're doing this, I'm learning new things. So, I always love this. Uh, if you can, you know, walk us back just a little bit, you've been here for, you know, like, you're one of the pillars to this industry. So, how did you get started? And, you know, fast forward to today. Wow, um, without going into too much detail, pretty traditional route, except I did know I wanted to be a CPA at the age of 15. 
I had a very good high school accounting teacher who had a two-year program, not just a one-year program. So he would bring in CPAs. He taught us how to do taxes. I started my own accounting firm at the age of 15, doing my dad's books because my dad was a barber. He did a bunch of his friend's books. I did IRS audits all below the age of 18. I don't even know if it was legal, uh, but that's how I put myself through college. But once in college, I knew I wanted to go into the big eight. So it was a very traditional route. And I thought I'd be in the big eight forever just to show you how naive I was. And I left after two and a half years, started my own firm. And that's where I realized, uh, and it hit me like a brick, that the billable hour was a lousy customer experience. And I just told my partner, we need to change this. This is something we created. We can do something different. I didn't know anything, I didn't know anything else because that's how I was taught to build by the hour, keep a timesheet. That's what we were doing. But once we realized that there was a better way to offer just a fixed price to the customer, give them certainty and predictability, uh, they loved it. And that led me to get very excited about the idea and wanted to share it with my colleagues. So I started teaching this in 94 after we did it in our firm in 1989, 1990. And there was nobody on the circuit talking about it. There were no tech companies out there, you know, with a great solution around it. There was nothing. And so we made every mistake under the sun. But I started teaching this in 94 to my colleagues. Everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, and now I say mission accomplished. I mean, there's enough firms out there that we've hit a tipping point with value pricing. And now I think it's time to move to the next model, which is the subscription model. So like this transition, I think so for many, uh, for many people that we speak with and we encounter a lot of questions around, you know, we, we still have a lot of people that are still doing the hourly. So before we jump, you know, like uh, to the, you know, basically like instead of jumping landline and straight, straight to mobile, I would love to just put uh, just, you know, maybe a couple of sentences into what value pricing really is in your eyes, because I hear many opinions on that, but I feel that, you know, it's, it's worth, you know. Worth flushing out. Yeah, I agree. I was just listening to a podcast this morning and somebody said value billing. And anytime I hear the term value billing, I know it's that people don't know what they're talking about because billing is done in arrears. Pricing is always done up front, period. So value pricing is more than just giving a fixed price. It is charging a price commensurate with the value that you create for the customer uh, that has nothing to do with your inputs, your costs, your efforts, your hours. Uh, and you have to, to infer that value from the customer. You have to have a value discussion and try and understand what is it that they're trying to accomplish. So value pricing is all about pricing the customer, not so much the services. So basically understanding how much is it worth specifically a specific service for a specific client and build that pricing accordingly. So every client potentially will receive a different price, you know, worth based on the worth that the service is for him or her. Right. It, it could be that every client uh, gets a different price, but you could also still offer three options. So with value pricing, we're big advocates of offering three options, along with, by the way, a value guarantee that says, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, if you're not satisfied, for whatever reason, only pay us for the value that you think you received, because I think that differentiates you in the marketplace as well. Uh, services that are guaranteed have a much higher value than services that aren't guaranteed. Yeah, and it's uh, and I think it 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 plugs in not even a hidden but a, a very direct trust in you as a service provider that you're very confident with your ability to deliver value. Unlike That's right. okay, sign here and here and here, and like okay, let, let's plan our divorce, if things go wrong, rather that you say, okay, I'm very confident with my abilities. And I think that's, that, that's the first stage of one differentiating. And the other is shying away from the model that is comparable to others. If you're doing that by design, I think you're different than most. And maybe this is a good segue to talk about the subscription model. So how do you see that? Like, how did that evolve from value pricing? 
or it's right. visible from that. It was just, you know, a new spark of, of, of ideas. Right. And, and the value pricing change was a business model change. Uh, it's in the subtitle to my book on value pricing that this is a, a radical business model change. But uh, people just tended to focus on the value pricing and didn't want to talk about the business model change. But the business model change is a fundamental part of it. And it's an enormous part of the subscription because this is a different animal. It walks different. It talks different. It quacks different. It's not your traditional duck. Everything about it is different. You have to go to the market in a subscription model with a plus offering. It has to be better than what you offered in the past and hopefully better than what your competitors are offering. And so my, my North star for the subscription model was the concierge doctor movement in the United States and also the direct primary care doctor movement where these are general physicians that basically say, look, you subscribe to us and whatever you need medically that we're competent to do, you're covered, period. So think about that, Omri. It, it removes friction. It makes the customer experience seamless. It surfaces simplicity. It gives the customer convenience, peace of mind that they're in good hands, whatever they need. The doctors will come to their house. They'll, they'll come to their office if, if need be, whatever they can do to, to help you. Um, and it's, it's just a more proactive model. And because it, it offers all these other things, I think people are willing to pay a premium today to save time. You know, most of us are constrained by time and we're willing to pay to, to get that convenience. And that's what I love about the subscription model. It's forcing firms to up their game. Thank you for that. And I want to like even simplify it even further. So let's say I, I run a practice, I have a hundred customers and right now I'm, I'm billing hourly. That's the first example. Uh, can I, first of all, make the shift and we'll talk about the ways to do that, but can I do it without stepping through value pricing, like, you know, jumping over the landline and getting to the mobile? I think you can. I, I see no reason because remember their business model changes. So I, knew, I see no reason to change from one model hour, hourly to value pricing and then have to unlearn a bunch of that and then go to subscription. No, you can leapfrog. No, no, I see no difference from moving from hourly to value pricing or just moving from hourly to subscription. Because one of my favorite ways, no matter how you decide to pivot to a new business model, one of my favorite ways to see that uh, work and, and one of the best ways that we know the highest odds of success are is to launch a new firm, to spin out a new firm that hopefully over time will just cannibalize the old one. Because if you're going to be cannibalized, as Andy Grove used to say, founder of Intel, it's better to dine with friends. It's better <laughs> that we obsolete ourselves before our competitors do it. And by setting up a new firm, you're starting with a clean slate. There's no legacy systems. There's no mindset changes that need to happen. I mean, it's, it's all brand new. It's like a clean slate. And I just think psychologically that that's your highest odds of success. So I'm with you, but, but I want to open options for other people that uh, to know that that's not the only option. Like, and we right. spoke about it a lot, like definitely the best will, you know, start fresh, that you don't have any legacy things, especially in terms of mindset and, you know, in different working models. But what are the, the three models? And I, I you know, I'm, I'm putting this, I know that you really, and, and I share that, believe that a smooth transition, but if I'm, you know, if I'm trying to look at, you know, entrepreneurship in general, we're, there's all, you know, we're all different. And when I'm like, like, if I'm looking at, you know, monkeys for that matter, some of us or some, you know, will, will you know, take a rope and jump and then they'll see the next line. They'll leave that old rope, jump and grab the other. Some others will take the rope, hold this and will reach out to the new and until this feels safe, they will not let go of the other. Right. So I want to accommodate, and I think that this is robust enough to accommodate different methods, uh, or at least have people don't feel that it's, you know, a zero or one option. So what are, you know, the two or three options that you see that people can make the shift? Right. 
And, and that first one, the spinning out a new firm, that doesn't mean you can't keep the old firm running. You just take some maybe hire new talent or maybe transfer some talent and some customers that are willing to go to the new model from the old firm, but you can keep the old firm running. Another model is where you do it gradually. You just start to do this maybe customer by customer. And that's how we advocated that you do value pricing. Value pricing was done one customer at a time because it was a customer centric pricing model. You could, you could just slowly, gradually transfer people from hourly over to value pricing. You could do the same thing with subscription, but there's a challenge with it. This model, a gradual model, yes, it's a low risk model. It's a test, right? You're going to dip your toe in the water. Like you said, you know, holding onto the rope while grabbing for the other one. Okay. But if it's a low risk model, it's also going to be a low reward outcome, right? Risk and reward, or <laughs> they go, kind of go together in the opposite directions. And my problem is this is such a different business model because you've got to go to the market with a plus offering that it's really hard to do that within the same firm. You're, you're trying to operate with two different business models in the same firm. Now, look, large companies can do that. Apple does it. Disney does it. I can point to a bunch of companies that do it, but they're all very large, have a lot of managerial talent. Running two business models in a smaller firm, like you said, a, a firm with 100 customers, is kind of like having two spouses. You, you can do it, but you're probably not going to like the results very much. So the third model is to do what Adobe did. Adobe said, as of such and such date, I think it was about a year away, year and a half away, they said, we're no longer selling box software. Everything's going to be in the cloud. And when that date came, they flipped the switch. They weren't tech supporting the old box software. They weren't upgrading it. And everybody had to move over. From what I'm told, you can still buy the box software on eBay and people still buy it. But everybody's kind of gravitated to the cloud and Adobe's, of course, thriving. Um, and that's another way to do it. So now there's variations. If like, like I work with some bookkeepers, for example, and bookkeepers might only have 40 customers. Okay. If it was below maybe 50, maybe, maybe a hundred's the cutoff. I don't know where the cutoff is. It depends by firm, but if you've got few customers, then you can probably do this gradually. You can probably do it one customer at a time, but you just have to keep in mind that the subscription offering is not the same as a value pricing offering because it's not as concerned with scope of work as value. Price. Everybody gets hung up on scope of work and, oh, there's going to be more transactions if the customer grows or adds employees or whatever. None of that matters in subscription. None of it matters. You just cover the customer for whatever it is you can do. They're covered, period. So it's that form of insurance, but it also comes, I think, with a four to five times price premium. I think this can command much higher prices because of that just convenience and insurance that no matter what the customer needs that we can do, we can't do it. We shouldn't be doing it, but if we can do it, they're covered. So, so let, let's expand that thing on this because uh, it's very compelling to, you know, up our prices and, you know, think about uh, duplicating or tripling it or, you know, basically increasing it. I think the challenge that a lot of people see is more than anything mindset is the ability to first of all value something that we're currently doing and understanding that we can take that as a core vehicle and then plus it with different variations either service but definitely the structure and then position it differently just because we're leveraging that access to us so if you can give examples maybe from other fields so that this notion can stick, because I think it's very difficult to comprehend at the beginning when you're, you know, you, you first of all, you say, okay, let's transition to a new firm. So by design, it feels like, okay, I need to like reinvent everything. And it's okay. I need to be this brave business entrepreneur and ditch everything I've built for years. And I think it's not the case, but it is important to understand you know, you talked about a cutoff. So what, how will it look? Let's say we have a hundred clients and how would you share that with a client, for instance, how would you describe it so that people can understand what it is? Yeah. I'd want to talk to them about moving to this model. And, and I probably would use analogies like a direct primary care physician mm -hmm. or, or, 
if, if you're going after more of the high wealth earners, maybe the concierge doctor model, they're roughly equal. But the point is that those doctors, they don't take insurance. So they have a lot less bureaucracy internally. They have fewer customers and usually by 50 to 80% fewer. Whereas the average general doctor in um, the United States has a panel of patients at 2,400, a direct primary care doctor has only 600. So they cut their capacity, they have much fewer customers, but that means they can spend more time with them and make a bigger impact on their life, not just get them uh, well when they're sick, but to keep them healthy. That's a very proactive customer relationship. And I think that's why most people enter this profession. That's the other thing I think subscription does. It aligns with why we enter the profession. Ask any CPA, accountant, bookkeeper, they'll say to help people. Well, you can't help people if you have 2000 customers. We're kidding ourselves. At most, we can help them comply, sure. But we can't really make a deep, meaningful impact on their lives and their business if we're just jumping from one to another, like we're on a treadmill. And that's that's how a, a, a concierge doctor works or a direct primary care doctor. If I need something from them, if I stab a knife into my hand, I run to them. I don't run to the ER and they'll stitch me up or they'll come out to my home and do it. Um, that's just, it, it just swaddles the customer in a security blanket that says, listen, we're here for you. We're going to take care of you. And we always have capacity. These doctor's offices don't even have waiting rooms. <laughs> That's how good they are. They don't have waiting rooms because they run at much less capacity. And it, it's a much, um, I think, saner way to run a professional practice. I agree. And I think especially after, you know, if, if we're aware of most of the conversations, especially after any busy season is, okay, I'm burned out. My employees are burned out. We're like, it's a this you know roller coaster of a ride, and it's already to the extent that people are talking about the future of the industry and how you know the younger generation looks at this and says this is not the kind of you know profession I want to enter if it looks like this you know endless treadmill. Uh, so potentially, this has the ability to make a massive dent, and not only you know on a personal you know business but an accumulated way of the industry if we as a whole shift to something like this. Yes, I think it, I, I mean, we talk about burnout a lot and all the mental health issues that surround working too hard. I mean, alcoholism, divorce, mental health issues, all depression, all of these things. But I also think there's a component that we can borrow from the medical profession again, is, is this concept of moral injury. And moral injury is when you're not acting in your day-to-day -day routine as a professional for what you pledge to do as that type of professional. And doctors experience this all the time. They enter the profession to help people, not to get rich. There's a million different ways to get rich that are a lot easier than becoming you know, a doctor after 15 years or whatever. Um, but this concept of moral injury, I think accountants suffer from it too. We're here to help people and yet we just feel overwhelmed. And I think it's because we try and be all things to all people. We, we, we don't put enough focus on our strategy. We all want to jump to the pricing and talk about pricing. But I want you to think about your positioning and your strategy in the marketplace. Are you McDonald's? Are you a high-end uh, you know, steakhouse? Or are you a vegan restaurant? You have to pick. You have to put yourself in the box and focus. And a lot of firms don't want to do that. And a lot of smaller firms don't want to do any of that because they'll take all comers. Um, it's almost like accountants have this idea that they're going to be, they're, they're going to want to say, we're both a veterinarian and a taxidermist. That way, no matter what happens, we can tell the client, you'll get your cat back. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't heard this one. It's good. So um, yeah, but that leads that that comes with a massive price. And because at the end of the day, if we're trying to do that with too many clients, like burnout is inevitable, or, you know, a very poor service. So and, and that's why we're, we're as a profession, I'm talking about, we're eating our young, right? Nobody wants to come into the profession, we have this talent crunch. Um, and you got to ask yourself why? Because is, is it the professionals are flawed? Or 
It'd be like if I if I asked you to change your light bulbs throughout your house and you screwed them all in and 50% of them blew out, my guess is you wouldn't blame the individual light bulb. You'd blame the electrical system. Well, the electrical system in this case is our fee for service business model, whether it's hourly or whether it's even value pricing to some extent is a fee for service model. We're only paid when we do something to the customer, not when we do something for them. So the subscription model puts the relationship back in the business. It changes our model from transactional to relational. And this business is all about relationships. And I think we say that, but I think we pay lip service to it because when you look at our business model, ask yourself, what do we monetize? It's the transactions. It's the scope of work. But we're in a privileged position as accountants. We have the ability and the, and the talent to transform our customers, to bring them to a new place. And we don't talk this language. We don't express it this way. But what you're really in the business for uh, is to transform people to bring them to a new place. Because when you transform somebody from where they are or guide that transformation to where they wanna be, the customer's the product. It's the services are a means to an end. The end is that transformation. And I think that's ultimately where we need to go because that's the highest point on the value curve. There's nothing higher than the transformation. I completely agree, but and I, I want to, maybe dive into this a bit more because for someone just, you know, coming and listening to us, and this is the first time hearing this potentially, they can say, okay, you know, like it sounds like a bit fluffy in a, in a sense, like, okay, we want to like add so much value and change people's life. But at the end of the day, right now, I'm in a position that I'm burned out. You know, I have, you know, shortages of employees, and I'm competing in a, in a space that is being commoditized by others and by tech and now AI. So I think there's sort of a feeling of being overwhelmed. And despite our you know inner desire to help people and you know and, and stay back with it, I think potentially people looking and say it's very daunting. Okay, so what do I do? And especially in the accounting space, so people like structure and they like certainty more than you know taking risks. So, and, and I think this is not for everybody, but I think it should be for everybody. <laughs> and, and part of, you know, I think your quest for years has been to help people understand where they can actually go and I hope that my journey will be to make it push them towards, you know, solutions that potentially can help them actually make it into reality faster. So going back to, to the question is, how would someone that is currently a bit overwhelmed should look at this? Should he or she say, okay, I understand the value of this. I understand conceptually that this is something huge. This could, you know, mean le working less, earning more, providing much better service, you know, escaping the fact that this is a commodity race and basically monetize or putting value towards a relationship, which is the biggest currency, you know, this space has. That relationship, the rapport, the trust that you have with your client. This is the thing. And yet, you know, we're billing or pricing it on time or, you know, a specific scope of work. So they understand it, but I want to pe give people the encouragement to, you know, make a small step towards this. And now that I'm thinking, instead of asking a question, so sorry for that, I'm thinking about let's take it back. For people that were probably very, very afraid to making a, a move to value pricing. Because everybody, no, it's hourly. It's like, so that was a very big move. What do you think made companies that made the switch, first of all, make it? And what differentiated those who made it successfully? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, the commitment to it. I think, um, you know, not giving, your, giving yourself permission to fail. When people started moving from hourly, including myself, by the way, because I made every mistake under the book. In fact, it got so bad, Omri, we almost went back to hourly billing because I said, we can't do, we, we couldn't figure out how to do it. And you got to give yourself permission to fail. Just it's like learning a new software 
or learning a new sport, right? Your performance is going to dip for a while until you go through that learning curve. And then your performance is going to ratchet back up and hopefully to a higher point than where it was. Um, but to give people encouragement with this, when I talk about transformations being the highest point of the value curve, they were designed to decommoditize services and experiences. Experiences and transformations kind of go together because they're both deeply personal. Experiences happen outside of us. Transformations happen within us. And because we're all unique human beings, right? I, I can't substitute one friend for another like I can with a good or a service, right? Transformation affects me personally. It changes who I am. They're, they're represented by the memorabilia that we have, our wedding rings, our, our diplomas on the wall, our CPA certificate, whatever it might be. Those, those you know, document our, our, our transformations. And the encouraging thing about this is accountants already provide transformations. We just don't use this language. When I look and think about all of the things accountants do, and this includes bookkeepers, accountants, and CPAs, we help our clients grow their businesses. We help those businesses become more valuable. We help our, our, our customers retire, maybe sooner if that's their goal. We help them buy their vacation homes. We help get their kids into college. We help plan their legacy for after they've gone. These are all transformations, every single one of them. We don't talk about it that way. We talk about scope of work and the estate tax return and the, the, the retirement planning. But those, no, those are personal transformations. Think about Warren Buffett or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. They've got these foundations, you know, for after they're gone, they're, they pay a, a lot of attention to their legacy, Bill Gates Foundation and whatnot. It's the same with our customers. A, a, a transformation doesn't have to be grandiose. It could be as something as simple as working on their business and taking it to a new, uh, a new destination, maybe get them financing or, or, or a capital to expand. But we need to focus on those transformations. I, I'll give you a great analogy for this because I think this will resonate with people, even if you're not a golfer. If, if you wanted to take up golf, or if you were a golfer and you just wanted to improve, maybe you wanted to get into the single digit handicap. So you're a 15 handicapper. You go to a golf pro and he's going to say, Omri, I'll give you lessons for 150 bucks an hour. Now he's trying to sell you a service, right? Or a series of services. But what if you came back to him and said, no, no, Mr. Golf Pro, I'm not interested in your lessons by the hour. Just make me a single digit handicapper and I'll give you 10 grand. Now, Assuming he thinks that you're capable physically, and, and a golf pro would know just by analyzing your swing, but if he thinks you're capable of doing it, will that change the way he works with you? Yes, completely. Will that change the incentive structure? Will he go out and play with you rather than just selling you half hour or an hour or less in here? No, it's going to change everything because he's going to be able to guide you to that transformation that's what you want. You're not interested in the lessons by the hour. If he can get you to a single digit handicap within two months, who cares what, what the number of hours it took? It's the outcome. And that's what we need to get to as a profession. We need to start thinking about these transformations because we can do them over and over and over again, serially from womb to tomb for our customers. And when you, once you start focusing on that, then you realize that the scope of work and the services, it just doesn't matter anymore. It's that relationship and that trust that matters. And we're in a privileged position to do that. Starbucks can't do that. Porsche can't do that. They can't. Yeah. Porsche can sell me a car and, and, you know, uh, get me over my midlife crisis, but they can't really change me as a person. Professionals can do that. And that's why we're privileged. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think you articulated it beautifully. And it brings us to a question uh, from the audience. I think speaking exactly to this, uh, like it's a long question, so I, I'll try to repeat it and, and do it justice. But Charlotte's asking, uh, basically, we are, you know, they bought in, they're a bookkeeping firm and they bought into the subscription model, but they have a feeling that they're being constantly drawn to the mentality of billing by the hour, 
and they feel that they're sort of like, you know, okay, I'm trying to do this, but I'm, you know, and it, it makes complete sense for me. Uh, there's a tendency with everything that we've done, you know, habitually, and we need to unlearn some things, but, you know, I'd love to get your, your take on it. Yeah, Charlotte, great question. Um, you're right. I, I wish I had a nickel for every time a firm told me, oh, we do subscription because we're billing monthly, right? Now, usually what they're doing is they're setting an annual price and that annual price a lot of times is just an estimate of hours. It has nothing to do with value to the customer. And then they're dividing that annual price by 12 and saying that's subscription. But remember, subscription is a plus offering. So one of the foundational elements of subscription is the income statement for your firm looks different. Your income statement starts with annual re beginning, annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue, whatever the period is. And then it backs out the churn rate, the lost customers, and then it adds in how much new recurring revenue you signed up during the period and you get an ending annual recurring revenue. So the income statement is forward looking. It's not backwards looking like the traditional accounting P&L. And the other thing is the KPIs are different. And when you look at the KPIs for a subscription business, and Henri, I have a chapter in my book that goes through all of them, and they're not mine. This is what's great about subscription is it's well-trodden territory. We don't have to invent the wheel here. And Dreesen Horowitz and other venture capital firms have already done all the hard work on what KPIs you should be analyzing in a subscription business. And not one of them, Charlotte, is based on time. So we just have to scrap that mindset. And look, that's hard. I don't care if you're moving from hourly to value pricing or from hourly to subscription, getting rid of that hourly mindset. The idea that time has value is really, that's, that's a mental shift that's really difficult, but it has to be done. And I think subscription can make it happen faster because your accounting and your KPIs are completely different. And if you, if you do it the right way, then you're just not going to pay attention to time anymore. Time, time is a constraint. It has nothing to do with value. It has nothing to do with the cost of your employees. I know you said you pay your people hourly, but you're not really buying their time. You're buying what they can do for your firm. Just like our customers aren't buying our time as professionals, they're buying what we can do for them, like that golf pro taking us to a single digit handicap. They don't care about the time. In fact, if we could do it faster, we'd be even more valuable to them. So uh, that, but I, I sympathize with you. That mindset is very difficult to overcome, especially if you're still doing timesheets. If you're doing timesheets, you're, you're mired in the mentality of we sell time. And there is no place for timesheets in either value pricing or definitely in subscription. And I think like another aspect that we can look at it is maybe, you know, a piano that you tune a piano. So if a piano is out of tune, you need to come, you tune it, and then you need to come back a week later and then three weeks later and then a month later because the strings have been in a certain state for so long that they have a tendency to go back to it. So when you're retuning it, you have to constantly, okay, bring it back until you actually make a shift. And I think our minds are at a certain age and we're all at that age, sadly. We're, <laughs> I believe everybody here are over the age of seven. Uh, with some of us, it's elast the elasticity is until 12, but we need repetition right now to embody something. And maybe this, is another good question that that answers the first thing we talked about is how to make the shift and the fact that you if you're doing a cutoff or a clean transition to a company an additional one that doesn't bill hourly that doesn't have timesheets that i think that enables you you know to go over you know basically set up set ourselves up for success with you know the fact that we're humans and we're being you know, we need to unlearn something. So the minute that you create an, a cleaner environment, your ability to make this shift is potentially, I think, a lot, you know, your chances of succeed, succeeding are higher. Yeah, I totally agree. This is one of the reasons I love Silicon Valley, Omri, and your world of technology. I mean, if you think about all the spin-outs 
that have come out of Apple and, uh, and these other tech companies, right? It's because people inside look at look around and go, oh, but w- this isn't being done right. And we could do this better. And they spin out and they create their own company. Well, why not spin out your best talent, the people that you're at Hyatt's risk to lose and say, look, we want to do something exciting over here. And I, I just think that's a, a great way to attract talent and keep it as well. I couldn't agree more. My question coming, you know, I'm, I'm coming from tech space and, you know, in venture capital and entrepreneurship on, on software. I would ask you, uh, how do you feel like what is missing in terms of the mindset? Because in tech, it's very, you know, we are conditioned in a certain way. We're conditioned to, you know, fail faster. That's the thing. You need to fail faster, learn and iterate because, and you understand that, there's never perfect and it's always going to be like this endless improvement cycle and you allocate resources by design to innovate understanding that this is not going to be ROI positive this is like for you to plant a seed for your next big thing so but this is really ingrained in both the culture the mindset and even in the economic structure that supports this economy meaning VCs that, you know, bring in the money, they actually, you know, if you say, okay, I'm spending 30% of my capital on innovation, they say, oh, great, you're doing a good job. I think for people that are not from the space, first of all, even the terminology potentially is different. And, you know, we have, and as she wrote, you know, we have payrolls, we have things like that. So it's very, I'm trying to, you know, coming from the tech space, I'm trying to give people a little bit of a in of what, what you're saying. And it is looking into other industries because I think the, and most of the teachings from at least my experience is happening within the accounting space. And I think that what you've done looking into medicine, looking into Disney, looking into Adobe and bringing, you know, bringing all these different models into the space, I think that's, very, very beneficial. And I I would advise a lot more people to do that because it's not a secluded, you know, space. You're living inside of other businesses and it can definitely, you can actually take someone else's ideas or models and, and right now to everybody listening, Ron has done it for you. You don't need to think it just from the book. So uh, so thank you for that. Totally agree. I mean, Steve Jobs got inspiration for the Apple store by studying four seasons, their concierge desk. That's where he came up with the idea for the genius bar. And what I get frustrated with in our profession is we benchmark one another. We're all in the same dirty bath water, you know, gazing at each other's navels, trying to figure out, tell me what the best tech stack is. Tell me that, no, look outside your profession. If you want to up your game, study, you know, Nordstrom, study uh, these concierge doctors and because they are changing the way medicine is practiced in the United States. Amazon just bought uh, one medical for $3.4 billion, the largest direct primary care practice in the United States. It's going to completely revolutionize medicine. Um, And that's what we need to be studying rather than, you know, trying to learn from one. Don't study mediocrity. Study excellence is what I'd say. So I I support that, but I give it a caveat of uh, better done than perfect, and don't try to get it perfect. Being excellent, or you know, uh, like don't set the bar to being perfect because it doesn't exist. Like from <laughs> tech, like I'm looking at perfect is the enemy because it it always making you being trapped in an illusion that you know you'll never do it it never will never be as good and you're looking you know for inspiration outside and you say oh no no they have it figured out they're in a different stage you know it's it's never the perfect time for anything it's just a matter of right. dealing with it and i think this is what i like about the book it really taps into the mindset of it and it like it it, it makes you feel that you're capable of doing it so that, but that's my my feeling. How would you like for people that are going to read the book? And I hope that everybody's going to read the book. And there's another like and to help you do that for anyone coming to scaling and are going to attend the uh, we're going to have a 
power breakfast session uh, that we go into more detail and in showing how it was actually implemented. So we're Ron is being amazing and he's going to do a book signing uh, and you're going to be able to get that book for free if you're uh, the early bird that are with us in the room then. But if you know you wrote the book and for someone who's going to read it, what is the one thing that is important for you to emphasize? Mm, great question. Uh, I want them to think about why they entered the profession in the first place. Roll back to that, your whenever that happened for you, and ask yourself, why do I? Why did I want to become a bookkeeper or an accountant? And my guess is you'll land on the answer to help people. And ask yourself if we're really living up to our potential as professionals that can guide these transformations. Because I don't think we are. I think we're paying lip service to this idea that we're the trusted advisor. If we need to align our business model with our rhetoric and align what we monetize, just like the golf pro, he's not monetizing half hour golf lessons. He's monetizing your outcome to a single digit handicap or whatever it might be. Uh, that's when I think we're at our best as professionals, when we just help people and we put the relationship first and we, we stop looking at the math of the moment. We stop getting caught up on scope of work. None of this is a good customer experience. It's like we're nickel and diming them. You know, it, it creates bureaucracies in our firm and prevents us, I think, from focusing on what's important. And I guess that's what I'd want them to take away. And I hope the direct primary care example inspires them as it inspires me. When these doctors started to come online, I, I was floored. I, I didn't even have the right language and vocabulary for it. So I have a whole chapter on these doctors and they're, they're pioneers. They're the ones out there changing the way medicine is delivered for all economic sectors, not just the rich. The direct primary care doctors are you know, serving the underclass and the under, underserved. And they're doing it fantastically at a very affordable cost, like the cost of a cell phone subscription per month or, or cable TV. That's incredible. Um, so I think I get inspiration by studying that. And that's what I would want people to take away from it, that, hey, our potential is unlimited. And we just need to expand our, our horizons on what's possible with our customers. And I see some, I see yeah, some yeah. more questions up here, Romney yeah. or Omri, but you tell me. So yeah, yeah, let's take it. And I have a lot of more questions for you, but I'll, I'll limit those, but let's answer people like, so take it away. Oh boy. Anonymous attendee. How do you come up with pricing for subscription based hourly models are more apples to apples and subscription seems a lot more variability. Well, you don't want to be an apple. Um, <laughs> you want to be an orange. You want to be a pair. You want to be something different. I don't want to be compared to my competition. Disney certainly doesn't, is not compared to its competition. Porsche isn't compared to its competition. Apple isn't compared to its competition. They charge premium prices. Subscription allows you to do that because your offering is different. And the customer will know this because your language is different. You're not talking to them about scope of work and hours and efforts you're talking to them about transformations. What are your goals? Where would you like to be in, in two years, three years, five years, all of that. And, and that just sets you apart uh, in the competitive scape, uh, landscape. And that's why I think it's, it's such a good move. Um, and then same, maybe same questioner, how would you set up a subscription billing for a client that has payroll, bookkeeping and tax returns plus phone calls? Well, you certainly start by looking at what you're charging now for that. And I'd say at least double it, if not triple it, uh, but then surround it with whatever else that you need that comes up that we can do, you're covered. So if you need a cash flow projection, if you, if you have IRS correspondence, we have to deal with or state correspondence, or you get audited, if you defend audits, then that's part of it. There's no more scope of work. There's no more out of scope whatever they need that you can do, then just do it. If you can't do it, go find somebody in your network, a specialist that you can refer them to, and you can still quarterback that relationship. This is what direct primary care doctors do. They don't do surgery. They don't do oncology services, but when their patients need that, 
they help them find one of those doctors. And then they actually go to the appointments and sit in and make sure that that new doctor knows everything about your medical history like they do. And then they quarterback that relationship. And we already kind of do that with bankers and lawyers and insurance people that we work with, wealth managers, all of that. But you don't have to do everything, but you do have to quarterback the relationship. Would that be the best business advice you would give an accounting firm or would it be something else? Uh, best business advice to give the accounting firm is really think about your strategy and your positioning in the market. Because that drives everything else. You know, people want to jump right to pricing, but pricing is dictated by strategy. Pricing is the junior partner. Strategy is the senior partner. Because think about the airline industry. If you're United or American or Delta, uh, you have a certain you know, hub and spoke strategy and all of that. And that dictates how you're going to price those flights. But if you're Southwest... <laughs> And you, you fly one type of airplane and you fly in secondary cities, you're not a hub and spoke, you're point to point, that drives a completely different pricing strategy. Southwest doesn't care what other airlines are pricing. Southwest cares how much it costs you to drive or take the bus. So their pricing is completely different than every other airline. Why? Because their model is different and their strategy is different. And so it's your strategy and positioning. You have to figure out are you McDonald's? Are you a steakhouse? Are you vegan? <laughs> and then that dictates your pricing. And so that means, because yeah, I think your firm is defined by the customers you don't have and the services you don't perform. And that's key because that really puts you in a box. It says, no, we don't do that. No, you're not the right customer for us. You have to be very, very selective. And again, I think we try and be all things to all people. And that's a prescription for either very slow and unprofitable growth or not success at all. Thank you for that. And like, you know, is this something that you wish you had known in your, you know, the beginning of your journey or this is something, or there's, what, what advice would you give yourself? Like, you know, if we take you 30 years ago. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, the subscription model back then was you know the uh, Columbia Record House? You may not know that uh, reference, Omri, but uh, that you know where you'd get 12, 12 records for a penny, but then they you were trapped and they wouldn't let you go. I mean, it was just a nightmare to get out of. In fact, I still think they're hitting my credit card somewhere. But um, th that 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 is not today's subscription model. Today's subscription model is not yesterday's subscription model at all. It's easier to cancel. Uh, it's easier to get out of. Plus, it's a plus offering. It's it's a, a think about Disney Plus. Think about Amazon Prime. Th they came to the market with a plus offering that was completely different than what was out there. Today, I can I can subscribe to Porsche, and I have access to a fleet of seven Porsches. If I if I want to get an SUV for the day to take some friends wine tasting, they'll white glove out an SUV and white glove my convertible away. I can do that as much as I want. I can trade out every day if I wanted to. Um, that's incredible when you think about it. And people say, well, how's that different than buying or owning or leasing a port? Well, it's not tied to a car. I'm not, I'm not subscribing to the car. I'm subscribing to Porsche. It's a one-to-one -one relationship with the company itself. And when we subscribe to a company, we have a different psychological relationship to it. So the questioner here, do you think clients like the subscription model? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just look at how many subscriptions your customers have in their personal life and in their business life, and I mean, especially in their business. The yeah, especially in their business life. They um, we we love subscription because it's easy. It's usually a better offering, just like Adobe plus the offering when they went to uh, on online software. So customers love this because it's easy. You're making it, who doesn't want simplicity, frictionless relationship and to be taken care of when they need something. Um, yeah, customers love this. What exactly do you mean by a plus model? Plus model. So this is a, this yeah, is this is a term of art. This is a term of art I stole from Walt Disney. Walt okay. Disney, when he started Disneyland, would tell his executives, we constantly have to plus this park, meaning I want you to go out there and look for things that we can do to improve 
the experience for the customer. He called it plussing. He said, this is what makes the park different than me shooting a movie. He says, once I shoot the movie, it goes in the can. I can't touch it. He said, this park is living and breathing. I can constantly plus it and make it more delightful, more surprising for the guests. That will keep them coming. And so he did things like the parades and things that cost a lot of money that his, that his executives pushed back on him and said, why, why are we doing that, Walt? It, it's not going to make a difference. And he said, listen, do you know how much it costs to get a customer? And do you know how much it costs to get a customer to come back? If we don't constantly delight them and, and, and surprise them in new ways, then we're going to lose them and, and the generations that follow them. And so this idea of plussing is baked into the model. Innovations baked into the model. For example, I'll make this very tangible. If you subscribe to one of these direct primary care doctors and they say, you're covered for anything that we can do under our roof. Well, guess what? Under their roof, what they can do for you is constantly expanding. Some of them have pharmacies. Some of them have MRI and x-ray and other types of uh, diagnostic equipment. Some of them do 23andMe analysis, you know, for DNA and that type of thing. So they're constantly adding things, you know, nutritionists, some have chiropractors, um, massage therapists, uh, other things. And, and they're constantly, just like Amazon Prime, is constantly adding benefits to its Prime members. And notice that the price doesn't change when they do that. Now, Amazon just raised their prices this last year. But when they raised their prices, they didn't blame it on inflation, raising costs, supply chain limitation. They showed you all the different ways they added value in the last couple of years. And they justified higher prices based on better value, which is what the customer cares about. Customers aren't our cost accountants. They don't care about your costs, how much you have to pay your laborers. They don't care about any of that. So we shouldn't focus them on that. We should tout and communicate our value and how we've added that and enhanced it. Um, and yeah, I, I, customers absolutely love subscription. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I'll, I'll add to that, that with that, there's a responsibility on our side as service providers, one that we feel very free with letting them go, meaning we don't try to cage them in this endless commitment. And the other thing is that we are taking the responsibility to deliver that value. And it can be, you know, we're always looking into, you know, very boutique, very high end products for these examples. And, you know, the person that spoke about, you know, I'm not an Apple, uh, you know, Mercedes has the slogan, unlike any other, that was their thing. It's not like that, but it doesn't need to be, okay, changing my entire business. It could be just like Walt Disney, look for that pluses, these small things that can make, you know, a massive incremental, you know, difference. And more than anything with our approach to how we view the value we bring. And I think that that would be, you know, the most meaningful and impactful thing you can do for your life because it's basically stepping out of this endless race. Uh, it's all of a sudden being the owner of, you know, the destiny that you choose to walk on. And, and then this is the niche that you choose or the value that you want to segment yourself with. And it's very, very personal. So I think I, I would, you know, we'll work on more things, I think, to give ideas for the accounting space that, you know, how, you know, things that they can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis to plus their offering and technology. I think right now uh, we're very privileged in this stage to have technology help us do that uh, and make that Absolutely. more accessible to clients and easier for us because, you know, a few years ago to make an impact, you had to go to school and learn, you know, an additional profession. Right now it's just making a decision and, you know, commit yourself to something and it's, the, and it's possible. So we're living in a very exciting times in, in that regard. So it makes these two things just align perfectly. And I see that we're, you know, running out of time and I want to be respectful for everyone's time. So I'll just, uh, before I say thank you, I'll invite everybody to Scaling Your Heights. We're going to be there and there's 
possibly an amazing opportunity that I don't know if will return, that you have uh, an option to, Ron was kind enough to give his time to one-on-one -on -one sessions. So you can actually apply. We're going to send a link just after uh, this. So you can apply for you know a one-on-one -on -one spot. You can ask him uh, anything uh, and he'll do his best to, to answer. Uh, and then again, we have a dive in uh, session around how to physically implement this in your business. Uh, and, you know, hope to see you there. And Ron, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Omri. I just want to say that breakfast session that we're doing together, we're also going to be joined by Hector Garcia. He'll be videoing in. He shot a, we did a video interview and Hector's actually making this transition. So he'll talk a little bit about that. I'm very excited for that. And also I'm doing two other sessions, three other sessions at scaling as well. I'm doing one on strategy and positioning because I think that's critical. You have to start there before you start worrying about your pricing. And then I'm doing one on the subscription model. So what we talked about here today, but going deeper. And I'm also doing uh, a panel with a couple firms that have started to make this transition to subscription. And they're going to talk about their challenges, their successes, their failures, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly in this model. And then me and Ed class are doing a keynote together on the main stage, which is, I think is our top 12 best business books of all time. So, uh, and then the one-on-one -on -one, uh, appointments at the anchor booth and the book signing, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So, uh, if you're at scaling, reach out. I'm happy to uh, have a chat with you over a soda or a coffee or something if you can't get into the one-on-ones, but uh, really looking forward to being there. Amazing. And I think like the fact that you're so active shows, you know, how passionate you are on making, you know, making this impact for all of us. So again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you everybody for, you know, putting in your time. I hope it was valuable for you. We'll follow up with links to all of the session Ron is going to have on scaling and everything we've talked about uh, on the anchor booth. Uh, and again, thank you and best of luck. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Omri. Thank you, Anchor, for doing this. It's great. Great thank fun. You.